Around uh, six years ago, I was preparing to finish up my uh, PhD in computer science. I had been studying how computers uh, could glean common sense knowledge, uh, knowledge about uh, ordinary events from the massive amount of language available from the web. And through the grueling process of searching and figuring out what I would do next, I somehow found myself uh, within the uh, rose garden of a, uh, one of the big, greatest thinkers in uh, psychology. Um, now this was, as a computer scientist, this was a pretty unusual place uh, where I didn't expect uh, to find myself. I would have better expected to be in a room full of computer servers with their fans, co cooling fans blazing, than uh, surrounded by beautiful flowers with uh, birds chirping. But Dr. Sullivan and uh, one of his all-star graduate students, Johannes Eichstadt, who was also there, um, had stopped me and both uh, figuratively and literally asked me to smell the roses. They were curious about uh, gleaning a different sort of knowledge from the massive amounts of language available uh, online, a sort of psychological knowledge, that of happiness and well-being. The idea was inspired by flu trends, a uh, Google project which found that the rates at which people search for various uh, flu-like symptoms, such as uh, fever or sneezing, seem to track the rates of flu uh, across the nation, at least uh, according to the uh, Centers for Disease Control. In fact, um, the Google search queries seem to precede the Centers for Disease Control, often finding an uptick in flu before. Um, like flu symptoms, well-being uh, was hard to measure at a large scale. Organizations like Gallup and the CDC, and I'm sure many others in the room, spend lots of money, millions of dollars yearly, surveying uh, the well-being of nations. It's often debated whether surveying, asking people about their well-being, uh, is the only way we should be assessing well-being. People tend to be uh, on a, sometimes not as self-aware as we expect, and they have biases in the, how they answer questions. In any case, the well-being of communities is already being recorded daily in massive amounts of social media posts. It's just hidden within. People are sharing their thoughts, feelings, social relationships, and really just their daily real-world happenings. For example, how they once uh, visited a rose garden and left feeling in a better mood and maybe finding some, some more meaning in their life. So we decided to launch an interdisciplinary project uh, between uh, man and machine, we like to say, or psychology and computer science, uh, the World Wellbeing Project. And this was housed at the Positive Psychology Center at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. That's uh, the picture you see, you see there. Uh, and these are some of the uh, key people to founding the project. Uh, that all-star now uh, Dr. Eichstadt, Johannes Eichstadt was the graduate student I mentioned. Peggy Kern from the, uh, now at the faculty at the University of Melbourne. Martin Seligman, of course. Um, and then Lyle Ungar is the other person there. A, um, uh, my mentor on the computer science side provided the glue between computer science and psychology. Uh, and so we really took an interdisciplinary perspective. In fact, Johannes and I shared an office and began to understand each other's field. Uh, I needed to learn that people were not just human entities that generated data. And um, he needed to learn that uh, trying to analyze language data in Microsoft Excel is, well, just silly. So here's how we do it. Uh, we have uh, Facebook status updates or tweets. Um, these are sent to techniques from the field of computational linguistics, and we try to pull out meaningful pieces of information from this. This basically takes your series of, to a computer, it's just a series of characters, turns it into something meaningful. Here we have like an example, a topic, um, which talks about having a, a good weekend. Uh, that might be something that comes out. We would then quantify this per individual or per community. And then we've got some sort of outcome we would be relating this information to, somebody's physical well-being, mental well-being, their um, happiness results from a survey. 
um, a different perspective. To look at this is if you consider that um, everyone, an individual might have uh, two pieces of information, basically their behavioral patterns, their social media messages, and then some sort of outcome we're trying to measure. We extract linguistic features from their social media posts. These could be as simple as just the words people are mentioning, how frequently somebody says, uh, this is, somebody says various words like this is great or uh, meaning. And then we use various statistical analyses depending on what we're trying to do to relate it to the outcomes. Sometimes uh, we're simply trying to relate it to the outcomes, other times we're trying to predict the outcome. Um, and so we're building a machine learning or statistical model that we can then take and use to predict. So let me show you some, um, an example of, of, of what comes out of this. So uh, we were first fortunate to be part of a study that, was, that acquired about 75,000 Facebook participants who um, were willing to share their social media posts as well as take a personality questionnaire. And we looked at the words that were related to a given construct of personality, a given dimension of personality. And this is what came out. The size of the word is its correlation strength, or how predictive it is of the outcome. The color is its, um, is its frequency. You might be used to seeing word clouds where the, the size is its frequency here. Um, it's really about the predictive strength, what, uh, what, what distinguishes people. Uh, and as you can see, for example, the word party is, is uh, highly distinguishing of this feature. Uh, uh, also, hit me up is very predictive, but it's not very frequent. Let's see. Um, well, now I've just given away what it is. You had a, if you had a chance to think about it, uh, this is describing extroversion, uh, which is um, usually characterized by being energized from socializing. Um, but you, you also see love you, for example, is both frequent and highly predictive, where on the other hand, hit me up is um, not very frequent, but when it does appear, it is very predictive. One of the, one of the interesting or little nuggets in this result deals with the exclamation points. It turns out the more exclamation points you use, up to three, you're more extroverted. So two exclamation points, you're, you're pretty extroverted. Three correlates with being very highly extroverted. Uh, once you get past that, four, four exclamation points is uh, actually, it goes away. I think that might be a signal that you're angry. So on the introversion side, you might think for a second, well, what would you expect on the opposite dimension of extroversion? You know, this is, this is people's daily, everyday language, um, just the things they're saying on a, on a daily basis. Um, you, so you might expect some solitary activities, and that's part of what came out. Uh, internet, computer, uh, my computer science colleagues really like this one. We're wanting to get a t-shirt with it. Um, but then we also found some things coming out that maybe, you know, are not, um, in retrospect, aren't, don't, don't leave us questioning what's going on, but are things we would have never thought of ahead of time. And in fact, we worked with people who studied extroversion, and they had never s really known this relationship to, for example, anime, manga, Pokemon, Final Fantasy. Um, even these emoticons are Japanese-style emoticons. There's a lot of uh, interest in, in a culture, in a Japanese culture. Um, that seems to correlate with introversion. And this is among Americans and um, citizens of the UK. Um, so it's pretty surprising. Um, but this is uh, uh, just at the individual level. I'm kind of giving you a flavor of, of, of how this sort of analysis works. We then scaled up to the community level and going from maybe 20 million posts up to 20 billion, a whole order of magnitude, a thousand times uh, more uh, pieces of info posts and trying to quantify then can we understand, better understand the dimensions of community from their social media. Uh, and so the idea is kind of similar. We're extracting information um, rather than from a person though from a given community. Here's an example of counties across the US where we're getting tweets coming out and we basically analyze these tweets in order to encode uh, the kind of the signature of a community, almost like a genome. So every community, we give this sort of social media um, encoding that describes basically how often they're mentioning certain words. So this one, you know, might be mentioning sleeping not very often, um, but on the other hand, uh, might be mentioning training and exercise a little more frequently. Uh, and so each community then is represented in this way. Um, and in fact, across the US, um, we looked at a, a roughly 2,000 uh, counties. 
And then we can take this encoding and we can relate it to uh, some sort of dimension, something that we know about the community. Uh, here we did a heart disease mortality rates as according to the CDC from death certificates. And we saw, um, we looked at, well, how do these profiles of a community relate to uh, the rates of mortality within the communities? Here's what we found. So on the side of higher uh, mortality, we found topics related to hate and interpersonal tension and drama uh, were significantly predictive of communities with higher rates of mortality. On the other hand, lower rates of mortality, we saw optimism, talking about opportunities, um, goals, and, and strengths. And it's important to note these, um, these topics at the community level were not necessarily, the people tweeting were not necessarily the ones dying of heart disease. But these communities, the people who are tweeting are markers, are nevertheless strong markers of the health of a community, of the um, psychology of a community. And so in areas where people are tweeting more about hate, there's higher chances of dying of mortality. And in areas where they're talking about opportunities, there's less. And we'll talk a little bit into how these um, factors converge with um, socioeconomic factors. So what about life satisfaction? So running uh, the same type of analysis relating to the Center for Disease Control assessed life satisfaction. These are uh, the top 10 topics that, that came out as predictive of communities with higher life satisfaction. So you really see a range of different types of topics that are being said more frequently in these communities where people are, are thriving. You see, for example, uh, the talking about exercise and training. You know, these things are known at an individual level to make a difference, uh, but this is one of the first times we've seen it, we saw it at the community level, as sig um, evidence that exercise is related to well-being. Um, ideas and suggestions, you know, the types of things we're doing here today, communities that do more of this, thinking, um, also tend to score higher in life satisfaction. Uh, and then money, of course. Um, it's a long known relationship between uh, money and well being. Um, however, uh, there are lots of different uh, discussions of money that come out on Twitter, lots of different topics, groups of words like this. And if you notice, this one particularly focuses on uh, donations and giving away of money, philanthropy. So it's not just discussion of money, but discussion of um, philanthropy that seems to distinguish uh, the communities that have higher life satisfaction. So this kind of speaks to this idea of insights, where we're essentially taking the uh, outcomes that we're interested in, life satisfaction, and we're trying to gain insights about what is a happy community based on the language. We can flip this around and see how well can we predict a given outcome based on the social media. And so in this case, it's almost like we're trying to test, can we make a language-based assessment? To what extent can we supplement and replace questionnaires uh, by looking at people's social media posts? And so the idea, to, to show it visually, is we've got some uh, rates as reported by the CDC, and then we're gonna produce some rates of mortality on Twitter. Now when we do this, we produce these rates for every community without, we build a model without actually looking at the community, right? So we run some statistics with communities basically held out, put in our back pocket to build a model that predicts mortality. This is how a standard practice in machine learning. Then we say, okay, on these held out communities that we didn't see when we built the model, how well do we predict the mortality rates in those communities. And we can compare it uh, to variables that are already available. So here we have first uh, the uh, demographics of the community. Unfortunately, there are still health disparities in the US, depending on uh, the demographic makes, makeup of the community. Uh, it gets up to about a 0.1 correlation. This is, again, out of sample correlation with um, rates of heart disease, atherosclerotic, particularly heart disease mortality. Then here we have the behavioral risk factors typically associated, uh, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity rates of the community. Uh, we're getting up to 
a little bit higher, about 0.2. Income and education, known predictors of the quality and um, even health behaviors of a community, get us up a little bit higher than that. We put all these, all these predictors into a single model um, and predict the well-being, and we're getting close to about 0.37. Okay. And then only Twitter, only using language, uh, these models, these encodings of the community, um, and actually even ignoring these other variables, we find that Twitter by itself is able to predict the rates of mortality at a significantly higher accuracy than all these variables combined. And when we combine uh, the two together, um, we get a small improvement. Now we've been, it's actually a difficult problem to combine the two. Now we get a little bit better, but um, the basic idea is uh, Twitter is telling us a lot about a community. If we were to quantify how much, well, it's at least more than all of these um, standard variables. So when we look at life satisfaction, um, we've done the same thing. Uh, this is a very recent result. We're actually now getting up to um, when we use Twitter combined with the, um, the socio-demographic variables of a community, we're getting up to, I believe it's like a 0.65 um, out of sample correlation, which is considered very strong. A correlation above between a behavior and a psychological attribute, which is, of course, not as, um, you know, has, has a harder ground truth to measure than, than many other things. Anything above 0.4 is usually considered a strong correlation, and now we're getting up to 0.65. We're actually getting pretty close to rivaling test-retest. Uh, if you ask people to, to answer the life satisfaction questionnaire twice, um, the correlation between the two is somewhere around 0 0.7, 0 0.75. You can explore um, our assessments across communities at this website, map.wwbp.org. Uh, it will let you explore different constructs of well-being. Here, we, we've, uh, the numbers I presented for, were from a comprehensive view. You can explore the uh, PERMA construct, positive emotion, engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and achievement, um, as well as many other dimensions, uh, and even look at how they relate to the um, socio-demographic dimensions. And, and now we're moving on to focusing a lot more on um, other nations. Uh, with uh, Mexico, we've been working with uh, ANEHI a bit, their statistical wing. Um, uh, with Spain, we've produced a, um, a well-being map actually within, within Spain. Um, in China, um, we've been studying the difference in well-being between urban and, and rural uh, communities. And uh, so we're really reaching out and um, at this point where we're trying to explore the length at which such techniques can be used at an international scale. And so uh, I hope you have seen how social media and big data analysis can reveal new insights and be used as a measurement tool for well-being, um, how interdisciplinary projects uh, can lead to greater insights than working in our siloed fields by ourselves, um, but at the least, um, perhaps the words of happiness you have seen on the screen have been a little bit akin to the experience uh, I had of stopping and smelling the roses. Thanks.